Holy shit, here we are back again. It's been since April since I had a Warrior Poet podcast. And I'd like to apologize to everybody out there who's been uh, bugging me to get on here again. I do appreciate the nudges. And uh, hopefully we're going to keep this thing rolling this time. Got a few trips to Peru, a few things to do. But I'm committed to the Warrior Poet Project from here on out. You have it. And just to show that, just as I was birthed into the world by my mother here, I'm rebirthing this podcast to you guys at the same time. So, Mom. Yes. Welcome. Thank you very much. To the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for making this all possible, literally. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. So, for those of you who don't know, my mother obviously is an amazing woman. Some of the highlights, which you could never probably properly encapsulate, but you were a Wimbledon semifinalist, yes. ranked up to number six in the world at Five. one point. Five! <laughs> I was shortchanging you by one whole position. Yeah. Ranked number five in the world as a tennis player. Went on after that, got your black belt yes. in Tang Sudo. Right. Uh, became a high caliber dressage rider. Yes. Managed to raise myself, and depending on how you count, either three or six other, six other children. Uh, yes, seven total. Seven total. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and are just a general awesome fucking human being who recently got back from a trip to the jungle to see Don Howard, Gandalf the Wizard, doing ayahuasca and wachuma. Yes, and we would not have gone if you hadn't walked into the living room, sat down, <laughs> and talked to us about it. And then my husband jumps up and says, we're going to go. We're going to do the whole thing. And because we're never going back. And I looked at him, I thought, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, do you realize how long that is? And so he, I didn't mention it. And then we went. That's, that's awesome. So yeah. we're going to get to that. So that's, you know, hang tight. But we're going to go through the full story and learn a little bit about you. And then, because that's a pretty remarkable story. I don't think, you know, there's, there's many people that have, you know, reached that kind of gamut. And I, I feel very blessed to have that, you know, as, of course, such a strong lineage in my, in my family. But let's talk about that because I'm obviously very close to my grandma. I told the story about my grandmother and, and seeing her when I crossed over to the other side yeah. doing the Vilka. Um, but, you know, bring us back to, to kind of how you grew up and some of the some of the values that kind of came through, came through from there and, and what led you to be, uh, you know, such a successful tennis player. Uh, it's an interesting story in the way it connects to the jungle because the jungle kind of connected the dots. I knew all the different little parts, but when I went to the jungle, it, it gave me balance. Uh, started out, uh, mom and dad were great people. Mother uh, was a nurse, father was a teacher. I, at nine, I started playing tennis, and from then on, I knew I was gonna do something. I didn't know what it was, but it was either gonna be horses or tennis or ice skating. So, uh, ice skating, I didn't know what it was going to be. Yeah. The <laughs> same man that taught me tennis was also doing ice skating. I didn't know you could ice skate. Yeah. <laughs> not very well. Not very well. <laughs> We're talking, get around the ring. Maybe that's why I like hockey so much. <laughs> yeah. Look at this. I'm learning new stuff all the time about myself here. Uh, so my life at nine changed to, uh, be very goal oriented. I knew almost exactly what I had to do. I had immediately had images of going to Wimbledon. Uh, so I knew that I knew where I was gonna go. I didn't know how I was gonna get there. So played tennis at 15, I started traveling uh, to Mexico and Canada at 18. My parents got enough money for me to get a one-way ticket to Europe. Uh, so I went to Europe, mom says, oh, you're gonna love it, uh, go to Italy. I get off the plane and I go, uh, where is the tennis club? <laughs> <laughs> So, so you just brought a, you brought your racket, right, you brought right. like one outfit, that's right? That's it, that's it. And you were just going to show up and play tennis in Europe. That's it. And I didn't <laughs> even know if they'd accept me. So luckily the guy says, well, you've come this long ways. Uh, let's see how you can do. We'll give you a hotel. So I said, okay. Gave me a hotel and I'm on clay. And it is ridiculous for a Californian <laughs> who's played all their life on cement to go play on clay. Now a clay court player slides and hits the ball. A, a concrete player runs and hits the ball. So I ran, hit the ball, and then slid. So I was <laughs> halfway off the court. Anyway, uh, it worked out, and I, I got enough money to go to the next tournament and the next tournament. Uh, after nine months in Europe, I got enough money to fly home. 
<laughs> so <laughs> work your way back home. Right, right. So that's how it started. And from then on, I played in Europe all the time. Uh, I had a wonderful time playing as an amateur. Play. It's it's almost impossible to do that now. You can't. You know, do like that that's that no. that paradigm doesn't even exist. Like go over, no. play tournaments no. and just work your way around yep. Europe and figure it out. No, it's I a was, shame. It sounds like a great adventure. It was amazing. The men and women played together. So uh, in Italy I met the Italians, learned a little Italian, then you go to France, learned a little French, uh, then you hit all the English tournaments, you go to uh, Ireland, Scotland, play on that grass, get ready for Wimbledon grass. Uh, then we would take trips to Australia and South Africa and then South America. It was a fabulous life. A lot of stress, I, but everyone was doing it. I mean, I was my own travel agent, my own coach. Uh, I did all the museums, everything by myself. I couldn't really get anyone to go with me. Uh, once in Paris, I got someone, a few Americans, they said, we gotta go see the Mona Lisa. So I said, great, I took them to see the Mona Lisa. They looked at it, turned around and left. <laughs> so, <laughs> all the way to the Louvre yeah. and that's all they saw. Yeah, uh, there just wasn't that much kind of interest in it, but uh, it was a fabulous way to live. Then uh, Billie Jean wanted more money for the women, came in, uh, changed the game so that the women were on their own and made more money, but it separated the men and the women and then it got so businesslike, all of the special kind of magic went out of it. We, were treat, we weren't treated as guests any longer. We were treated as business people. Mm -hmm. uh, you're making money, you go find your own hotel. Before we had dinners with dignitaries, with ambassadors, with kings, like the king of uh, Sweden. Uh, then it was, no, you're, you're making money, do your own thing. So all of that left and we weren't staying in the homes of the people. And then we were just with the women. And I don't know if you've ever been with a large group of women, but. I may have <laughs> once, once or twice. I don't know. We, I, mean, I may not have shared all those stories. You are my mother, but I, I occasionally I've found myself with okay, a large group so of women. Okay, so you know they get jealous. <laughs> I, maybe. Right. Allegedly, if I had been with a large group of women, uh, I may know that. All right. So <laughs> they're all fighting for you. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, they get pretty catty. Uh -huh. uh, you know, it's it's not unlike one to start saying something negative about the other one. Ah. Uh, uh -huh. So anyway, you end up pairing up with one, say, because that's who you practice with, that's who you sleep with, that's who you eat with. And that life just became difficult for me. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other women enjoyed pairing up together. It wasn't kind of my cup of tea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. yeah. Nice euphemism right, pairing, up, right. pairing up together. I'm always wishing. I'm saying, why can't I be both? You know. <laughs> I mean, look what's happening. You are what you are. You are, you you are what you are. Anyway, uh, we did make a lot more money, and uh, it changed the the world of tennis. So I was very lucky to get both sides of it. Yeah, that that uh. So Billie Jean was someone though that you had grown up knowing you know yes. you guys were in the kind of the same local clubs yes. out in, in southern california yeah, we were long beach and she was she was you know phil jackson in you right, right from the start she was very powerful mentally she would she knew how to play the game i was younger than she was so um she she basically i i don't know how to say it exactly but she was pruning me to beat me <laughs> basically mm -hmm. and she was a fabulous player of course uh, but it was very difficult mentally to beat Billie Jean King she was very strong mentally you get someone like Chris Evert and she was had a different type of strength she was so tough emotionally that things didn't bother her. I never saw Chris Evert have a bad day mm -hmm. you take someone like uh, Martina Navratilova uh, incredibly physically talented but emotionally could be uh, back and forth uh, still she was a champion but it was very interesting to watch the different champions yeah I say I say Phil Jackson because I'd known a, a basketball coach yeah. um, who was you know what really well respected basketball coach and, and Phil Jackson you know th they found themselves in the same restaurant and it would be normal, you know, there's only like 28 coaches, you know, right. just say like, hey, how's it going? So one of the, you know, the coach I know came over and, and say hi to Phil, just totally snubbed him. Yeah. Just kind of gave him a nod. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> nothing else, yeah. you know, because he knew that was kind of competition yeah. coming up, yeah. and that was kind of what Billie Jean had done. Well, that's the game. Yeah. And they play it on and off the court, and uh, it, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's part of the game. It's the way it's done. Uh, I think you're going to find it in every single sport. Mm-hmm. You don't let down. So if you would have been able to take some ayahuasca before you played Billie yeah. Jean at Wimbledon, yeah. <laughs> might have been a different story. I might not be born, though, so <laughs> we, can't, we can't be that excited about it because the difference between getting in the semis of Wimbledon and the difference between winning Wimbledon is a Huge. totally different life. Huge. Absolutely enormous. And I look back on my own life, and I was pruned or kind of re- reared to uh, be an ambassador, to think of the other person, to not be emotional, to always be in this uh, kind of perfect realm of not too emotional, not this, not that, and I was supposed to win. So I felt like looking back on it that I was supposed to be this tiger, this competitor, uh, this predator, and I had no claws. Mm -hmm. So what happened to me is I went into the mental side of it. I then had to find a way around that because I was worried if I was going to play someone how badly they'd feel at the end of it. That's not a good thing to do when you're competing. (laughs) So it's I not did, part of the top no, MMA strategies no, for mental no, preparation. No, that doesn't for work. Sure. No. Uh, so I had been raised that way. So then I said, okay, I am going to be, an, an, I'm going to analyze everything. So I'd watch my opponent. I'd find out what their strengths were, what their weaknesses were, and what their patterns were. And one of my really good friends, Rosie Casals, she basically started calling me IBM. Because <laughs> I just, I had all this knowledge and I had all these different shots and I had all of this stuff. And pretty soon I realized, okay, Kathy, you have got to simplify this. You can't do all of that. Uh-huh. Uh, but that is the reason I could win is that I had so much more knowledge and I knew their patterns. I would actually, which p- players do that? They bait you. And like if I knew they were always going to hit down the line, I'd stay on the other side, give them all this room and say, yeah, look at that. And then they'd hit it down the line. I was right there. Yeah. So the I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. You, you continually beat me until I was like, what, almost 30? Oh like like three gosh. years ago, finally, yeah. maybe the tide turned. <laughs> but it took all of my adult yeah. life. And you would just be laughing as yeah. you hit the balls in different places, oh. knowing exactly where I was going to hit. Yeah. And, just, yeah. and me mentally falling apart because right. my mother's beating me <laughs> again, right. even though I'm in the prime of my youth and strength. Right. Right. And then uh, something that works all the time is you compliment the other person. Yeah, this is a secret a out there, trick. guys. But compliment them. Tell them, oh, my gosh, your serve is so incredible. <laughs> and what happens is invariably they'll start thinking how amazing their serve is, and they'll try to make it even better, uh-huh. and they double fault or they hit it out. So that works all the time. You've so exposed I, one of my yeah, best tactics. I, I know, I know. Your backhand is on Fire right, today. right, right. That is a, you are ripping them down the line. <laughs> yeah, I am, aren't I? It works every yeah. time. Even when you know it, it works. Yeah. If the, there's one one of two ways is going to work when yeah. you're trying it yeah. in gamesmanship. The complimenting almost always works, yeah. but there's a few people yeah. that that doesn't work, and, and then more direct shit talking works. Right. Like, right. like my brother Brian type right. of shit talking, yeah. which is just more traditional. But the complimenting game, That's especially really for racket sports yeah. or golf. You know, golf, yeah. golf, if you really want to screw somebody right. up, which is really rude. You should right, be rooting right, right. for everybody, golf, yeah. but nobody does. Everybody pretends to root for somebody. You're like, man, your drive is incredible today. <laughs> that distance is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, it is for sure. Yeah. And, and any of those mental games. You did me a great favor. We we're playing ping pong a little while ago. <laughs> and he says uh, to me, he's only, you know, I've, I've got like five points, you know, only five points to go. And, you know, you're done. And I went, wow. He really focused me. Five <laughs> points. I can do five points. So yeah. he focus, you focused me. And man, I had to say thank you. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. It's a gift. <laughs> yeah. It's a gift. You know, that's one of the things that, you know, it's been really awesome growing up is you reach such a, you know, competitive level that the wisdom translates. It doesn't it matter that I wasn't a tennis player. No. I was a basketball player or whatever other sport I was playing. Yeah. Some of the same things translate. Like, like there's a time where you double up your practices. There's a time where you that's practice right. less. There's a time where you're focused and, and there's a time where you're relaxed and all of these mental aspects of competition they apply across the board and not only that they apply to life that's right and we were in a lawsuit and our attorney brought in a female attorney well the judge loved this female attorney so at the end of the day i said you got to use her 
He says, why? I said, because every time she talks, he agrees with her. Every time you talk, he looks the other way. Strategy. Strategy. But there, what you have to know is that you will make the mistake minimum three times to learn these lessons. So do not worry about making mistakes. It is the process of learning all of this. And that's what was so great about sports. Every day you're out there putting yourself on the line, making these mistakes. So this isn't knowledge just handed to you. This is knowledge that is burned into you. Yeah, <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> oh man, I cannot tell you how many times I exhausted myself because I was so nervous the night before I'd go for a run. Next uh -huh. day I was like running through cement. I yeah. wasn't on top of it. I was through it. Yeah. Uh, I made every mistake over and over, and then finally you get to the point where, okay, I get it. Every athlete has to make the overtraining mistake yeah. <laughs> for yeah. themselves. You know, no matter how many times you say yeah. it, you know, just pushing it a little too yeah. hard, coming back from an injury too fast, yeah. you know, being sick and being like, oh, I'll power through. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you one of the hard ones. You don't feel like you're going to do it, but you don't want to admit that because you want to think positively. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to win. I'm this, I'm that, I'm this. But inside, you don't really see that you, you're really like, eh. So what do you do then? That's the big problem. <laughs> that's the big problem. You're just pointing out problems? I thought uh, you have answers. You're one problem. of the wisest people I know. Come no, on. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I made it because I relaxed and said, one time I made it, I said, okay, Kathy, you're one point from losing this match. It's getting dark. Everyone's really angry at you. They don't want to be here any longer. It's starting to rain. And you're one point from losing the match. I said, would you go over there and hit one shot for yourself? So I did. I went over, hit one shot, won the point. And then she had me 40 love. She's going to win the match. So I, I said, okay, that worked. Don't, don't talk about it too much. <laughs> would you go over on the other side and hit one shot for yourself? And I did it. So I bring the match back, win that set. Everybody's pissed off because now we split sets. <laughs> <laughs> they got to wait longer. Yeah. So <laughs> then I had to come back the next day and I won the match. So I got through it on that one. But I cannot tell you how many times I lost the match, knew I was going to lose the match, and was powerless to change that. It's this weird dance between yeah. being able to, you know, not be attached so attached to the outcome that yeah. you're afraid of that negative outcome you so go. you have to release your attachment to the outcome but still bring in that passion and for a lot of people that seems like how do you do that how do you release your attachment and still care but yeah. you can because yeah. you're still going to care yeah. you know but still be okay with the fact that hey i'm i'm all right i'm yeah. a, i'm a good human being yeah. you know i'm going to be fine if i lose so let's yeah. just go out there and fucking give it hell yeah you know and i think i, I wish you were there to tell me that <laughs> But I think you're, that's, there's, the wisdom is in that. The time I did really well at Wimbledon was when uh, I realized, and I had to say this to myself, no one cares mm -hmm. except me. Yeah. And in the back of the, my, my mind, I knew, okay, mom and dad, way over there in the U.S., they care. But really, all these people surrounding me afterwards, what do they, what do they care about? They care about the news, the excitement. Uh, I had a boyfriend at the time. What does he care about? He really wanted me to lose because I was doing better than he was. <laughs> and, and then you look at all the, the, your, quote, friends, and, oh, you're doing great. Congratulations. Good luck. They don't want you to win. So I had to really know that in my heart. What is that? What is that dynamic? That's that competition. Just competition. Yeah. They're just. I want to get, I, I want to be better than you. Uh-huh. You know, they're trying to be nice. The only people that really kind of wanted you to do well was they didn't want the other guy to win, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Or, you know, they were so out of it, there was no competition anyway. Yeah. Maybe they were number 120. Yeah. But that's, it's not that you're thinking good or bad or they like me or they don't like me. It's taking pressure off. And I just released all of that pressure and that was what enabled me to focus on what I was doing. It was, I was playing for myself. Mm -hmm. You've also mentioned that like when you have a slight cold or a nagging yeah. injury or, or an yeah. injury or something, that's something that takes a lot of pressure off Absolutely. because you're like, well, fuck it. I'm, I'm like sick. Yeah. I'm injured. You know yeah. that Michael Jordan, he had the flu and he performed so well. Yeah. Well, no shit. It's easy when yeah. you're, when you're sick because yeah. you got, you got no pressure. That's you know, right. it's like you got a built in excuse. Everybody knows if you don't perform well, you know, yeah. Yet that you were sick. So you just, you're relaxed. You're like, you yeah, let's just see what we can yeah. do. Yeah, you, you go like, okay, I had a friend. Uh, she got a bee sting on her hand. 
played the best tennis of her life, on her, and it was on her hand. Uh, you know, other times when you'd go out and you'd say, there's just no way today, I just, I just don't have it. And you relax. Like we were playing. It's like when you receive the serve that's out. Yeah. When you get a serve that's out, you call fault, you just rip it it's like amazing. a cross court. Like, it's oh, amazing. oh, okay. That's why when I watch someone like take uh, Roger Federer, I watch what he does under extreme pressure and he blows me away. Mm -hmm. The way he comes up with his best stuff at the most critical time is pure pleasure for me to watch. Yeah. He amazes me. Yeah. Uh, so the, the champions have mastered this. Yeah, one way or the other. Yeah. I think another thing that impressed upon me that you always mentioned is being either above or below your mind. You yeah. know, like you talked about some champions, and I don't know yeah. if you want to name names, yeah. but you talked about some champions who all they wanted to do was watch cartoons. Absolutely. They never really thought about anything. No. You know, just yeah. the, their mind never right. got in the way because right. they never really, <laughs> <laughs> never really got there. That's exactly right. And then there's some people who harnessed their mind and kind of mastered that level, probably yeah. like Roger does, yeah. I'd imagine. Yeah. You know, where they're just above those thoughts that are, that are going to weigh them. So yeah. above or below, but don't be right in the middle. No. Don't be right in that no. mind state because no. you're going to be screwed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can. I've seen players, especially nowadays, go out and just pound their way through. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen other ones be inspired. Uh, I've seen other ones uh, just ruin themselves with fear and anxiety and thinking too far ahead. Watch what happens when a new younger player gets close to winning. Uh, it, it's real iffy, and you like to watch where, which way they're going to go. Sometimes mm -hmm. they'll they'll win, but then the next year, watch them. <laughs> but that's the they beauty that's like. the beauty yeah. of sports you know it's that's what, that's why no matter what sport it is yeah. when the stakes are high and people yeah. really care it's it's awesome to watch because really yeah. what you're watching is you're watching how people respond yes. to this immense immense yeah. pressure that's been put on them are they going to yeah. rise to the occasion are they not you know and that's that's what really makes it interesting and that's the microcosm for life cuz all without all the cameras rolling and without everything we all have those moments yeah. and we either fold or we either overcome yeah. and the rewards to our own lives are just as great as the rewards to these athletes on our own on a different scale that's right whenever you got into kind of a, a difficult situation i would look at you and sorry for saying this but <laughs> i would say it's like the samurai sword how do they make a sword they yeah. pound it and they mold it and they put it in the fire and they bring it back out and they pound it and they they hone it and they sharpen it shit i thought that was my idea <laughs> and now i realize it was your idea sorry everybody uh, that was not my original uh, idea no no, no we both worked on it because that was your love <laughs> yeah that was your love and uh that is really the way we learn mm. you know yeah no doubt yeah so if you were to take a look back, and, and I still we got a lot of other areas to touch on, but if you were to take a look back now with your wisdom and say, and give yourself some advice, you know, going back, which would apply to, you know, advice to giving to, to people now, what would you say would be the, the lessons that you've learned or just a few simple things that you would tell yourself? Uh, for me, uh, I'm really glad that I went for things. On the other side, I didn't have enough balance. I didn't say, you're doing fine. This is the way it is. This is the process you go through. I would chastise myself. I would feel like I was the worst person in the world. Uh, I would want to go eat pastries until I was sick. <laughs> you know, I, I just didn't have balance. I didn't realize, you're fine. This is OK. You can make it. Um, and then the other thing I didn't do, and this all came up with the ayahuasca, I wasn't there when I was successful. When I was successful, like I don't have any pictures of me at Wimbledon, except for what the press took. I don't have any pictures of me at, in the French Open, Roland Garros, in the Italian, in the American, uh, at Forest Hills. I don't have any of it because when I was successful, that was just the step I hit to get to the next step. Mm. Everything was looking forward. Everything was looking forward. Alan Watts has a really yeah. interesting kind of talk on this. And he talks yeah. about even the conditioning of our grade school, you know, the way it goes. Like you're in kindergarten, you graduate kindergarten. Then first grade, you graduate yeah. that. And everything is looking forward to the next step. And then all the way through high school, well, the next step then is college. And yeah. then the next step of college is, you know, your career. And everything 
it's almost like the whole structure is laid out that way. And yeah. for the athlete, it's very much like that. Climbing yeah. rankings, climbing yeah. numbers, winning this next one. Until all of a sudden you're like, what the hell have I been doing? Like, right, right. You know? and, and, and then, you know, I've been studying different gurus and different writers, and they say, you are already a luminous being. You are perfect the way you are. And I go, wow, that is so foreign to me. <laughs> 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 Maybe if I do a little bit better, right, right, I'll be right. a little bit brighter. <laughs> Let me go work out first <laughs> and have my, you know, perfect meal and take my vitamins or whatever I have to do. But that idea was so foreign to me. So I would look back and balance myself out, you know? Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, I was driven. Yeah. So how do you, how do you what do you say? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, really, you don't ever regret the mistakes and the no. stuff like that. It's just almost the quality of life that, yeah. that you look back. Like, yeah. I can look back and look at all these different choices and whatever, but really the only thing that I could say would be to just stop stressing so much about yes. the negative and stop beating yourself yes. up about this other stuff. I mean, at, at 25, I was so stressed out about what I was doing or where I was going to be and how I was going to do it. I would tell myself, Alexander the Great conquered the world at 25. Yeah, right. What the fuck are you doing, <laughs> Aubrey? You know, you're doing nothing. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> you're worthless. <laughs> you haven't accomplished anything. And just so you know, annoyed by that. Whereas you know, at 25 or even in college, you know, just simply being in the moment and enjoying that and trusting that. Yeah. You know, still thinking about it and planning and working hard, but just trusting that, yeah, it'll it'll happen. You know, it'll yeah. work out. Yeah. Or even worried about the negative situations, the negative stuff that comes up. Every negative situation that happens, guess what? We deal with it, yeah. you know, and yeah. we go through and we figure it out. And usually at the end of the day, we're like, yeah, I'm kind of grateful that happened yeah. because of X, Y, Z. There hasn't been one that hasn't been like that. But nonetheless, you freak out about right. the positive potential looming dangers. You yeah. know, the simulator in your brain gets really activated and plays out all these horrific scenarios that yeah. you solve that you may never even have to solve, A. And if it does come up, guess what? You just fucking solve them. Yeah. You know, and so maybe you, that was the way it's supposed to be. Right. I mean, the more people I read now, because now I'm searching, uh, if I had had the feeling that I had guidance, if, if I'd had the feeling that I was surrounded by unconditional love, if, if I knew where I was going, uh, it would have relaxed me so much more. I know people that feel that totally, and I look at them with admiration. Uh, I felt alone, I felt so much fear. Uh, so on the other hand, because I didn't think that there was life after death, uh, which I'm looking for now is life after death. <laughs> it's just a small thing. Uh, I, I was consumed with enjoying life. Mm -hmm. I was consumed with the moment. And that was probably my greatest gift was that I knew that every moment was priceless. Yeah. And that's yeah. the counterbalance to that other thing yeah. that you were talking about. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a big part yeah. of it. And yeah. I think, you know, people that lament death and spend all this time worried about it you know i that is something that gives life real preciousness yeah you know and, and a chance to you know imagine if you live forever and you got really wicked bad momentum at the start right. you know like fuck <laughs> fucking five thousand years of this <laughs> you, are you kidding me oh, <laughs> you know but i mean I, I could obviously be great too but there's just some, there's something precious about the the temporal nature of yeah. existence and, and I didn't want to break the moment. Uh, if I was dancing, there's no way that I would even imagine taking a picture. If I was it, watching a sunset, I didn't want to go take a picture. So I never had a camera with me. Uh, and I know life is different now. That's why you got you don't have a very good Instagram, Mom. <laughs> your, Insta your Instagram no. game is really weird. I know it's terrible. It's <laughs> terrible. non-existent, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never been on Facebook. Sorry to say, <laughs> I tried to get on yours. Yeah, I know it was a, it was a good <laughs> effort. Right, right, it was a good effort. But anyway, there's so much value, and the jungle helps you. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You've been okay. seeking different ways, and then I came back. I tell this story, um, and you decide to to take the plunge and you we'd done ayahuasca before together right. but you decided to go down to see um don howard down in the jungle so tell us about that experience uh we went to the jungle because uh, when you came back you were different there was a calmness and kind of a f uh i don't know a, a movement in you that you were you were peaceful mm -hmm. that i'd never seen 
So I said, okay, if he can get it, it's got to be down there. And, he, and so when we went down there, uh, the ayahuasca without a guide is not as valuable. Don Howard is an amazing guide. He will not say a lot, but he'll say a few words. So I go into ayahuasca the first night, and I get my typical aquarium, which I would see fish. Ayahuasca TV. <laughs> yes. And uh, I went, not again. This was the fourth time I see the fish. So I go, <laughs> okay, all right. So then I see a few other little things, but I realize ayahuasca, they call a stern mother. She will give you what you need, not what you want. So I went in with these amazing intentions. Feel the love, feel the light, you know, get experience the, the God, the spirit. These were my intentions. This is where I wanted to go. And I'm seeing an aquarium, <laughs> you know. So I get through that whole thing and I'm a little discouraged. We have a meeting the next day and this guy was an eagle. He was flying above. Another one was a jaguar going through the forest. And they get to me and I go, well, you know, I saw the aquarium. <laughs> But I knew something was going on. So that night, what happened to me in the jungle is that my experiences happened after the ayahuasca. They came in visions, in lucid dreams, and they came to me in, in shockwaves like that. So I, I got to the point where I said, all right, I'm gonna go through this horrible tasting stuff that makes you really nauseous for four hours minimum, and then see what happens. So. Uh, I did that, and the next day, I was expressing myself, my fear of the unknown, my, the unbearable thought of never living again, and what I wanted. And so Don Howard looks at me and said, well, have you ever felt unconditional love? And I go, sure, yeah, I feel that for everyone else. Feel it for my son, for my daughters, for our family. I feel it for the little baby fawn. I felt it for this baboon in the, in the zoo that I said, come on down and talk to me. And she came down and I started doing hand motions and she copied me and I was overwhelmed with love for her. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt it and then he says, just throws in a quick little word, well, do you feel it for yourself? Ooh. Oh dear. Oh, oh the, dear. Wizard. the wizard. The wizard <laughs> says the right thing at the right time. Yeah. As a wizard is right. wont to do. Oh gosh. I said, Well, I kind of well, how am I supposed to where am I supposed to do that? He says, Well, in your heart. <laughs> and I go, Oh. But I realized then things that we've been talking about started to come to me. So I realized that I was raised to think of everyone else, which is a good thing. Uh, to to kind of not really celebrate what I was or what I did. When I came home from Wimbledon, I slept on the floor in the garage. I, yeah, I, I, I wasn't ever allowed to get, quote, the big head, which all of that's good. But I began to realize I didn't have unconditional love for myself. And I was embarrassed to talk about myself. Well, maybe you just haven't accomplished enough. I, no. <laughs> maybe if you God. just accomplish more, you could really finally love yourself, oh, okay? God. <laughs> Don't expect me to accomplish any more in life. I'm done. <laughs> uh, so yeah. that's where it all started. So I go to bed that night with these thoughts. And when I was born, I was born angry with black hair. And my mom said, as soon as I came out, oh, I'm so sorry, she's angry. So. She apologized to all the nurses. Immediately, she had wanted me to be the perfect little child. And this is no blame. This is trying to understand it. Mm -hmm. So that night, I had lucid dreams of, I saw Mother Mary with golden light shining on this baby that was me. Black hair. And you're not Christian. I'm not Christian. <laughs> but Mother Mary was my image of mm -hmm. divine love. And... I was dressed, I thought, first I imaged myself, and this was a lucid dream, with silks and jewels and the amazing. I was special. I was like royalty. And then I got hit with this, yeah, but what if people think you're, you got too much? Oh, okay. So now I'm in the swaddling clothes. Mm -hmm. And Mother Mary is loving me as the poor child. So then I felt better. 
because I was both. Right. <laughs> Even in my lucid dreams, I couldn't be too good. <laughs> but I felt a personal, unconditional love that they were giving me. Uh, so then the next day came about, and I did ayahuasca again. And I saw fish again. I did see a few snakes this time, which was cool. Uh, they were iridescent, and more snakes were being born out of their mouth. So that was good. But from that moment, then I started to go into my heart. I said, what is my heart? Can I feel unconditional love in my heart? So I put the baby fawn in there, born, just a little newborn. And my love is unconditional. Then I had an image of my heart like a doorway. And I was going to go up to the Masada with Howard behind me. And Howard said he could help me with this. And so my heart was a doorway. It was open from the back and open from the front. And it was a golden frame with doves on the front. And Howard was in the back. So when he blew the smoke over me, and I'm in front of the Masada, I got a brilliant light in my heart. And then I saw kind of the rainbow colors as like light coming off of it. And I went, okay, there it is. There it is. I will, I will nourish it. So that was my first connection to the unconditional love. But knowing me, I've got another goal. <laughs> so once I feel unconditional love in my heart, I want to feel the source. Mm -hmm. And is that asking too much? <laughs> you know? I don't know. You got to ask Ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I read all these, others, these other reports, and these people feel the source. They feel the light. Sure. They're, they're transformed. So this is my goal, my intention. So I take Vilka. I go to take Vilka. So you'd switched over from the Ayahuasca to yeah, the Wachuma. Yeah, I was stuck in this deal, mm -hmm. but it carried through. And Vilka is a very potent DMT... Uh, substance that you snort yeah. actually 5-MeO DMT DMT bufotenine and old 4,000 year old recipe snorted through a Chavi knuckle bone snuff tube it's amazing stuff and you have the real knuckle bone the real knuckle bone 3,500 years old yeah everything is steeped in ceremony everything is real the Masada had come to life in front of me I saw faces so I was trance like so mm -hmm. I take the Vilka, go back and lie down, and I start seeing everything. I start seeing tunnels. I start wanting to ascend. I surrender myself. I see a little light, and I want to go towards it. Then I see figures in front of me, and I didn't know what they were, whether they were. I felt they were ancestors, and they were large, six figures, five figures in front of me, standing there. And I thought, that's cool, but I'm after the light. <laughs> So I said, excuse me, pardon me. Right, right. Um, would you mind stepping out of the way? I'm <laughs> heading toward the light. <laughs> like, uh, uh -huh. This is what I did. I bet you are. Right, right. Good luck. This is what I did. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on this tunnel going upwards and there are vines and everything going upwards. And anytime I saw light, I dart over to see the light. Uh, didn't see much. So I finished the Vilka, 45 minutes, go back in and Howard is there. And another guy is taking some more. And I go, Howard, I didn't get where I wanted to go. <laughs> so he said, would you like some more? Do you think you can handle it? And I said, yes, I can handle it. I take more. And I mean, I'm just snuffing this stuff up. And, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't care about dying at this stage. Right. I wanted to get to the light. Uh -huh. Go back, lie down. There's not an actual risk of dying, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're supposed to feel your death. Fe I, yeah, I, I, I metaphorical did, death. Yes, you feel yourself in the world of spirits. So I go back. I see a large spirit in front of me, dark shape, amazing, like man shape. And I go, that's cool. That's nice. I like that. Then I go to into another room, a veil parts, and I see other things. And I go into another room, and. My dead loved ones, I think, are there, so I tell them all I love them. But I'm on a mission. I'm going to the light. So I keep looking room to room. Pretty soon, the vilk is over with. And I come back. I'm lying there, and then I said, okay, I'm getting hungry. It's time for dinner. So I sit up. I'm just getting ready to get out of bed, and I get hit with this, this I don't know what you call it, a thought or 
whatever it was, the light's in you. The light's in your, it's, and I knew what he was saying. They were saying, the light is in my heart. Yep. And I went, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> so that so was. So powerful. You yeah, know, and there's, yeah. uh, that just shows the wisdom of, of this medicine. You know, if the medicine had shown you light externally, that lesson, which is probably the most valuable lesson of the whole trip. Yeah. Would it, it may not have hit you because. No. You'd have been like, oh, yeah, the light, it's out there. You got to go down to Peru. You go, yeah. you take a boat, you go to the jungle, you snort some stuff yeah. out of a tube, and then you can see the light, right. you know, which is cool. Yeah. But what's way better is knowing that you're carrying that light in your heart, yeah. that spark of source, you know, that yeah. force that animates all life and that it animated creation on the macro level. You're carrying that yeah. in your heart like a little furnace always there with you. And how can you love source? without that incredible feeling that you love yourself. Because you are source. We are source. How can you feel one with everything? If you don't appreciate, you don't start with you. I can't feel one with the animals, one with the plants, one with the source, one with the light, one with anybody, Jesus, Buddha, Allah, uh, any of them, Krishna. I can't feel it until I feel it inside. So I got a huge lesson. It doesn't mean I can't get more, because you know me, I'm gonna go for more. But I can't go anywhere but here. This yeah. is, I have to feel this and understand this. How big is that? As big as it gets. Yeah, yeah. As big as it gets. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, <coughs> it's funny that, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of people listening here and they're going to be thinking about their own parents yeah. and they're going to be, you know, roughly my age or around there, thereabouts, a little younger, a little older, maybe. But this wisdom about these plant medicines and even this basic understanding of spirituality of the word source for, you know, because for the older generation, it's either God or atheist. Yeah. Right. You know, and and there's all of these different levels of patterns that people have been stuck in because they really didn't have a way. They didn't have the internet. Right. They didn't know about ayahuasca. They didn't have podcasts. You know, we're so fortunate to be able to have these things. Yeah. So they're gonna be thinking, how can I get my parents interested in doing some of this? How can I help them? So what, what would you say as far as for people to try and get their loved ones, you know, aware, interested in these kind of fields? Well, if I go with what happened to me, it was you. And Howard talks about reciprocity. I gave you my heart and soul. You gave me all the love back. I gave you this, you give me that. So if they have something that they really want to get to, use to improve their life, do it. Then go to your parents and say, this is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Let them want it, let them see it. And let them, because some of them are going to be afraid and say, you know, I'm fine. And that's great. So others are gonna say, towards this end of my life, that's what I want. Be the change, be, be the, change, the change. And then let them see it. Well, seeing your change, I've seen you do other things. I wasn't interested. Yeah. When I saw this, I was interested. That's why I went. So the reciprocity is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the best advice. You know, fear is such a limiting force. You know, yeah. people are scared to change what they've set up. I mean, because for a lot of people, you know, I mean, you had some dramatic impacts, but for some people, the changes is going to basically rewrite their entire story. Yeah. And, and that's incredibly terrifying for people. And innately, they know they know that. Yeah, and you're not going to be like anyone else. Uh, some people had divine experiences. Other people were, their greatest fears came up. Uh, someone with huge anxiety was thrown right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Another person was purging his ancestral debt. And they actually, according to the guys next to him, saw a black mass land in his purging bucket and scurry out the door. And Howard and the shamans saw it and started laughing. They watched it go out. <laughs> so uh, this is not for the faint of heart. 
you're not going to be able to go in there and organize what's going to happen. And sometimes it's not overwhelming. I mean, I would go in there and see fish while you were sailing through the universe, yeah. having starships download information <laughs> into you. And, yeah. and I got the aquarium. <laughs> By the way, the third night, I had complained so much about the aquarium, I saw nothing. <laughs> so the fourth night, I said, I'm sorry, fish are okay. But make it a little more interesting. <laughs> so they showed me the primordial, like, ocean. Uh -huh. I was way down underneath seeing how all life began. Strange, huh? Interesting. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's by releasing expectation, yeah. just surrendering to what is. Yeah. It's important. Yeah, there's that balance between setting your intention and then letting it go completely. Yeah. You know? Some people say, in fact, I heard a thing yesterday, the guy said, yeah, I set an intention once. And he said, I'll never do it again. He said, when you set an intention, life is going to bring all of this stuff into you. And you're just going to be bombarded with it. So he said, yeah. he prefers to go at it a little slower. <laughs> just leave it be. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mom. Yeah. It's a beautiful life. It's a beautiful life. We're very blessed yeah. to live it. Very you blessed. Know. Sometimes think that we're really living in the golden age right now. You know, we're still able to access these primal feelings and these emotions that a being, you know, 5,000 years ago that's a pure consciousness wouldn't be able to feel. And 5,000 years before, we wouldn't be able to access these higher truths in this source. And yeah. we're living in an amazing place in a, in a, golden, in a golden time. We are. Uh, I do believe they got there a different way. I do believe that they understood they could hear the plants I, they could look at the stars they could do things not everyone back then it may be have been more the elite mm -hmm. but the way your american indians looked at the world sure they're the connected animals, at all they times were connected to the great spirit yeah so it, we do have more opportunity than ever before for sure it's i don't know if man has ever been without it yeah I, I would probably say that, yeah. especially when walking bare feet on the earth. It's yeah. a lot easier than, than in the place we are now. There you go. There you go. But it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been an, it's been an honor. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I love you, Mom. I love you, too. Yeah. Bye-bye. All right. Warrior Poe people. Uh, Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> and thank you, Mom. And uh, thank you, Orlando. Thank you, world. We'll be back again next week um, with another key ally in my family and uh, we actually have a couple podcasts next week so maybe we'll space them out but i'll uh, i'll keep you guys posted on all the social media stuff but much love glad to be back thank you